Lori Mahalik Levin is our guest this week. Lori is an attorney who believes in empowering working parents. She's the founder and CEO of Mindful Return, author of Back to Work After Baby, How to Plan and Navigate a Mindful Return from Attorney Leave, and co-host of the Parents at Work podcast. She and her husband, Jason, have two boys, ages 10 and 12, and they live in Washington, D.C. Her thought leadership has been featured in publications including Forbes, The Washington Post, New York Times, Parenting, and Thrive Global. Lori Mahalik Levin, welcome to Next Steps Forward. Thanks for having me, Chris. It's really good to be here. No, we appreciate your time. That's a lot of stuff you do post-legal uh, career, but we'll get into that here in a minute. <laughs> Let's start off talking about your law career. You're a graduate of Georgetown University Law Center and an attorney. What prompted you to choose law as a career? Chris, I love public policy. I love big picture issues and change. And I also love foreign languages. And so for me, I'm a regulatory lawyer and reading the law and interpreting the law and translating it into English for people is kind of like reading foreign languages. So the other reason I went to law school in addition to loving public policy and history and things like that is that I did not particularly enjoy math and <laughs> stats and data. And so when I was weighing the degrees, you know, the public policy degree versus the law degree, there were no math requirements at law school. <laughs> and that's simple math to do, right? Yes. Exactly. You said in the past that before having kids, you were a hard driving associate at a global law firm who admitted that you weren't very good at setting boundaries. You said you're a regulatory lawyer. You know, what's your expertise and why did you practice in that field? Was it because of the foreign language concept? Was it all of the above, no math, something special about it? <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to be a litigator. I knew I sort of didn't want to be arguing in a courtroom. Um, when I discovered this thing called regulatory law, it was the closest thing I could get to public policy because it's it, Congress passes a law, right? That says, I don't know, the sky must be blue. And then the regulators are the ones who say, and here's the, the hue, and here's the paintbrush you have to use. And that's the nitty gritty that I really, really like. And I did, when I was growing up, have this dream of becoming a physician, but again, like math and science, not really my thing. And so I went into healthcare law in part because I really like that passion for caring for people. Um, I ultimately became a Medicare reimbursement regulatory lawyer. And I mainly work with, and I still practice law as my side gig, but I mainly work with hospitals and health systems and academic medical centers and support them with their Medicare payments related to their residency programs. So how we train people to become future doctors. It's a, a niche that is a centimeter wide and a million miles deep, but I love teaching hospitals and I love helping hospitals that were never training any residents to become teaching hospitals. And what you just said sounded like a very long math <laughs> equation to me in terms of what you're doing. So I think there's a little yeah. bit involved in there. <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> so it's you're not a topic. It's not a topic I try to bring up at cocktail parties. At cocktail parties? It's a pleasant conversation, not, not really. <laughs> You're from Pennsylvania, your husband's from New Jersey, but you met in France on 9-11-2001. Yes. How did you meet and what was that day like for you both? Mm, um, I can't believe we're past 20 years ago now on 9-11, but I had gone to France on a Rotary Fellowship, a Rotary Ambassadorial Scholarship that basically allowed me to go to any country in the world that had a Rotary Club and to agree to give 10 to 15 talks to Rotary Clubs in that country, and then give 10 to 15 talks back at, in the United States when I came home, um, in exchange for paying for a year of education. And that seemed like a really good deal to me. And so I headed off to France, and I spent one month living in this town called Tours, doing a really intensive language program before my academic year began. And I lived for a year after that in Aix-en-Provence. But during this one month language stint, um, there was a happy hour that got planned for all of the incoming Rotary scholars in the country. And the happy hour, it turned out, was planned by my now husband, Jason. He was a Rotary scholar maybe three years prior to when I was. And he had moved to Paris after his year of studying and had become the first American, and perhaps first non-French person, to become the president of the Rotary Alumni Association in Paris. <laughs> so he planned a happy hour and the happy hour was not happy. It was September 11th. You know, it was basically a group hug hour. We couldn't believe what had just happened. Um, and it was a day of just being stunned, but that was the day that we first met. 
And how did your relationship progress from there? Well, we were friends for the year that we were in France. We weren't dating. Um, he lived in Paris. I lived in X. We planned some events together. And then I moved back to the United States to go to law school at Georgetown. And I was completing my first year of law school. And he and I kept in touch. He is very much a keeper in toucher. He just <laughs> uh, kept, he, he wrote a book that, uh, a year ago. It came out called Relationships to Infinity, The Art and Science of Keeping in Touch. So he is a real keeper in toucher. And um one day he wrote and said, you know, I'm applying to business schools and one of the schools that I'm interviewing at is Georgetown. And may I, um, you know, do you have anywhere that I might be able to crash while I am in town for my Georgetown interview? And my roommate had a gigantic FAO Schwartz dog. And so my husband came and slept on a stuffed dog on our floor. <laughs> And he interviewed for Georgetown and got into Georgetown Business School and wound up coming to DC. And then we started dating. I can envision that uh, that big FAO Schwartz dog. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's and, quite quite comfy, but maybe not for sleeping on multiple nights. Well, and I've got to give him props mm. because you know, 20 plus years ago, we didn't have the communication that we had today. And if you wanted to text somebody to hit see you, I'd hit the number one three times. Yes. <laughs> and so <laughs> I give him a lot of credit. Yeah, and, no uh, email. I mean, Jason is a um He's an analog guy. He loves writing letters. He literally writes postcards to people when he goes on business trips. Um, he is all about stamps. He's like carefully picks out which stamp is going on which envelope. He's a real like letter guy. Yeah. That's amazing. So obviously you two got married. You have two, as you described them, wonderful redheaded boys. Yes. They were a blessing, but I get the sense that your transition from working woman to working parent wasn't so easy. First off, how'd you feel parenthood changed your professional identity? Yeah, but it wasn't easy is definitely an understatement. Um, I was in tears on the kitchen floor a lot of times. Um, and I'll say with my first child, I found it challenging to go back to work um, in part because my son wouldn't take a bottle. And it turned out that I had excess lipase in my breast milk and I ended up having to scald it after I pumped it. It was just this whole ordeal. And so I had this narrative in my head that if I go back to work, my son will starve. That's not a very helpful narrative for you to have in your in your head when you're returning. I'd say in terms of like my own personal professional identity that was changing, I went from relative expert in a space who knew what she was talking about and was completely competent to having this human being in the house who I had absolutely no idea how to take care of. Um, I mean, I babysat for babies, but not one that lived with me 24 seven. Um, I mean, how to get them to nap, how to get them to burp, what the heck is going on? Why are they screaming for hours on end? All of that was totally new and very um, unsettling as a new parent. And then walking back into work, I realized I couldn't be the same exact person I was whenever I walked out the door to go have my baby. And I had the sh shame for me of, for example, having a hard stop at the end of the day and not being able to stay until whatever hour I chose because the daycare was going to close at 545. And if I missed that metro train, then, you know, my kid would be stuck there and they charge you $10 a minute if you're late. So there, there was just a lot going on in my head around who I was and what my role was and what I knew how to do and didn't do. And my confidence was really shaken. And you said you ended up in tears more often than not. You mentioned being on the kitchen floor. Why was the arrival of your second child so hard to handle? Yeah, baby number two. And my husband and I joke that one plus one equal to 85 in our house. I think with baby number two, with my second son, I knew how to do the logistical stuff. I knew how to get him down for a nap. I knew how to get him to burp, all that. Um, but it was just the compounded uh, logistics of the two children, right? It's the, like, it, some nights it felt like no one was ever sleeping. The toddler was potty training and the infant was up at night. And just getting two of them out the door to daycare and managing all the sick days multiplied by two, et cetera, was just off the charts for us. Yeah. My wife and I tell young parents or new parents, you know, when it's two on one, fine, no problem. You can tag team, you hand off, whatever. <laughs> but once you go to man to man zone defense. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's a whole a other ball game. Different ball game. And a former colleague of mine has two children, uh, four and two, and just last week had twins. So now four children born younger. And I wow. just said, good luck, buddy. I'll see you in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, get, get as many adult hands on deck exactly. as you can. Yes. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, right. That was my response. So when you found that there just weren't enough resources out there to guide you through the transition to working mom, 
I understand that your career coach husband had some advice. What did he tell you? Yeah, so I was in a really dark place, um, probably close to a year after my second child was born. And I wound up looking around for resources, as you said, that can help me with this transition. And all I could find was stuff about baby and some really snarky advice for working parents. Like, don't put a photo of your baby on your desk or people won't take you seriously, or you might leak on your shirt. That, that just was not helpful to me. And I ended up taking an online course called the Abundant Mama Project. And it was a community of about a hundred moms who lived all over the globe and had kids of all ages who were trying to find the abundance in life instead of the overwhelm. And I walked away from this four week experience feeling heard and seen and like I was not crazy for what I was going through. And I said to my career coach husband at the time, he's still a career coach, I said to him then, um, there should exist a course, a, a program for people to go through when they return to work after parental leave or while they're on parental leave that is like this, that creates a community that gives you structured resources. And my husband quipped, well, what are you going to do about it? And of course, I had an 11 month old and a two year old. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. about it. But I started blogging and sort of here we are eight and a half years later. You mentioned a minute ago that you're in a dark place, you mm. know, after the second was born. Was that whatever you're willing to share, obviously, postpartum? Mm. Was it a mental health thing? Was it just sort of like not sure what life was going to be like in the new norm? I think in retrospect, it was undiagnosed postpartum anxiety. And I don't think that our American healthcare system does a particularly good job of identifying and screening for these things. I mean, there were times when I was in my OBGYN's office bawling and no one, they were like, oh, are you okay? Okay, let's move on to the next person. And like, it's just not really how we should be taken care of. I've become active and um, am working to lift up a DC chapter of PSI, a postpartum support international. And, you know, I've become very passionate about that. Uh, issue. I wished I had recognized it for what it was. Yes, it was overwhelm and a lot of new parents experience overwhelm and a lot of new parents also experience more than that and should get more help than we're getting. And also, I, I love how you talked about the, the class you took, which was a global community. And, mm -hmm. you know, the saying is it takes a village to raise a family and yeah. you were, you were your own global village raising each other's families. Yes, exactly. And, um, I've been surprised over the past eight years as I've gotten to know working parents in lots of different countries, um, how much we have in common, quite frankly. I mean, people may have different amounts of paid leave and they may have different support networks and the transition to parenthood is a huge life transition no matter where in the world you live. Well, I think that point also in a, a post COVID world, post pandemic, people seem to be opening up more. You know, we mm. were locked down about, just about various personal things that maybe they wouldn't talk about mm. before. Yes. And now they just want to talk because they couldn't talk to anybody except their dog or their cat or their spouse or their kid for three years. And I was like, oh my God, to talk to somebody again. Yes. Uh, yes. That so, human connection is so important. Exactly. So you talked about blogging. Mm. What, what did you write in your first blog and how long was it before you started writing regularly about parenting topics? Oh, well, that question takes me back to the night that I sat there pretending to write my first blog post because I didn't really know what I was doing, but it, like my hands were shaking and I was on, on our queen size bed and it had this green bed spread. Like I just remember every detail of it. And I remember being terrified to just even write the first words. I was like, oh my gosh, who's going to read this? Like, I don't know, five people probably read it, but um, I wrote about the lack of resources that I saw out there. And I wrote about what I believed would have helped me through the transition back to work after parental leave um, versus what I was seeing out there in the world at the time. And in terms of how long, I think, you know, I did that one blog post and then I think I was probably blogging maybe every other week, twice a month for a while. And then ultimately maybe a year or so in, I got into a weekly schedule um, and started having a newsletter that came out every Saturday that included the blog post, et cetera. But it, it took me a little while to sort of ramp it up and feel confident enough to put something out into the world and attach my name to it and say, you know, this is what I think about this issue. And how long did it take before you began to attract a real following? Hmm. Um, I don't know what the definition of a real following is. And I actually don't even remember eight years ago exactly what it took, but it was sort of the thing that built on itself. And about a year and a half into blogging, I had enough traction, enough people who said, this is really helpful and honest and practical. 
and I had written enough, vo you know, in volume that I decided to take all the blogging that I had done and weave it into a book, which is how I wound up uh, writing a book. And so I'd say by the time the book came out, um, the Washington Post had gotten interested in the book and my programs. And I remember that about two years into building Mindful Return, we had about a dozen companies who were interested in partnering with us as a parental leave transition support. So about two years, we had sort of a good momentum and some critical mass going. And before I forget, we'll do it again later in the show, where can folks get a copy of your book? Ah, and all the places one finds books, um, Amazon, et cetera, but it is called Back to Work After Baby, and I've got a copy of it here. Perfect. And that is on our, our social media and website as well for our listeners and viewers. So you empower working parents to believe that parenthood is the perfect training ground for leadership and not a career ender. For decades, women have been told you can't have it all, you can't have a career and children and do justice to both. But you tell women that they don't have to choose between being a good mother and building their career. Can you square that circle for us, please? Mm. I don't think it needs to be a square. I think it fits perfectly around, around itself. Um, there are well-documented motherhood biases in the workplace where people just simply assume that a woman will be less competent, et cetera, or less invested in her career whenever she comes back. And I want to go back and say, well, I guess I want to like move way, 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 way back in human history. And one of the things that helped me get my head around this idea that it was a normal thing for women to be working and a normal thing for women to be raising children was reading Bridget Schulte's book called Overwhelmed Work, Love and Play When No One Has the Time. And Bridget Schulte's book um, talks about and interviews an evolutionary anthropologist named Sarah Blaffer Hurdy. And they're talking about um, women who lived in Africa hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. And she's talking about a world in which, I'm just gonna read this one paragraph because it is really the crux of what helped me to reach a, a, a new understanding of how successful parents can be at work and vice versa. Um, Sarah Blaffer Hurdy says, this is a working mother. The whole idea that mothers stayed at camp and men went off to hunt, no way. These women were walking thousands of miles every year with their children. Or if it was not safe, they were leaving them back at camp. She pauses to drive the point home. Sometimes mothers left their children back at camp. The children were with their fathers, older siblings, grandparents, relatives, and other trusted nurturing adults. People heard he calls allo parents, allo meaning other than in Greek. It is natural for mothers to work. It is natural for mothers to take care of children, she says. What's unnatural is for mothers to be the sole caretaker of children. What's unnatural is not to have more support for mothers. So that is one of the things that made me say, oh, okay, this is some sort of weird construct I have in my head that I can't be both successful at my job and be a, a quote unquote, whatever good is mother to my children. Um, but once I read this, I thought, oh, there's a lot more history behind this than just what meets the eye when we think about the past like 50 to 100 years. And that excerpt actually reminds me of an old Broadway <laughs> show called Defending the Caveman. And, and talking about, it. oh, it was a great show. It was 20 years ago now, but talks about men being hunters and women being gatherers and how women are the the support and the backbone of the family. And to your point, it's, it's the extended family in, in the village, the caveman village that supports each other while the mother goes off and goes to work. And so it's to your point, traces back mm -hmm. thousands of years. And so that was a great excerpt. Thank you for sharing that. Of course. Yeah. So I love this next title for you. You've been called a working mama guru. I don't know anybody who's got that title. Uh, and that was by Working Mother Magazine. How do you like that moniker? And do you feel that carries a certain amount of responsibility? I have to laugh at it a little bit. I mean, I sort of picture myself with little green Yoda ears or something. <laughs> um, do you have, do you have I, a t-shirt or a bumper sticker? Right, Working Mama Guru over here. Um, I'm a working mom. And I like to think that I have relevant experience that is common to lots of people and that they find value in hearing. And so for people who I've considered gurus in my life, they have been people who have inspired me in some way, but I don't ever really rely on one person as the be all and end all source of wisdom on any topic. So to the extent it says Lori's like the answer, no, there are a million, there are a billion ways to be, no, I think we're up to, how, what's the 
the world population right now about 8 billion? 8 billion, yeah. Um, there are 8 billion ways to be a good parent in the world. So to the extent Guru says, you know, I am the answer, that is not true. Um, sorry, there was a second part of your question. Well, do you feel that, that carries a certain amount of responsibility? Oh, responsibility. I mean, I do feel a certain amount of responsibility to working parents. I just feel a strong desire and urge to change the conversation around working parenthood and to not be quiet and silent about things that I see that don't seem to be very fair from a systemic perspective or an individual perspective. And so um, to the extent I have the opportunity to use my voice in, in that way, I want to do it. One of the parents who took your course wrote, quote, overall, I realized that being a good mother and building my career are synonymous, end quote. Synonymous is a pretty strong word when combining kids and careers. In the not so distant past, she would have been accused of rationalizing her career over her kids. Why are good parenting and building a career synonymous? I'm not sure if you're aware, Chris, of the neuroscience research that comes out of uh, Yale University, Dr. Ruth Feldblum. Um, but it has discovered, uh, the neuroscience researchers have discovered that the one year following the birth of one's child is the most neuroplastic that your brain is in your entire adult human experience. And so they are synonymous because your brain is literally malleable, plastic, rewirable at the same time that you are having children and you are gaining skills that are incredibly useful and incredibly helpful in the workplace. I can speak for myself that I am a better parent because I pause and I do what I'm inspired by and what motivates me during the day. And then I come and am with my children. And I am a better person at work because I spend that time uh, unplugging, rejuvenating, relaxing, et cetera, with my children. I think we also gain very specific skills around efficiency. I have never been so focused on the one or two most important things that need to get done when I don't know if I'm going to have to leave at 11 a.m. to go pick up a sick child, right? I mean, the prioritization becomes laser. Um, I know that I have gained skills in translating the needs that are not articulated very well in the English language into um, things that need to happen in a day, um, negotiation skills and patience. And I mean, the list could go on, but all of the things that I think about when I think of like the best leaders I know, it is those skills that they have around empathy and prioritization and connection and leadership that make them the best leader. And those are all things that we are um, practicing and training at every single day as a parent. So I think uh, it is a training ground and they're absolutely synonymous. You know, it, it's fascinating. So I do a lot of work in the veteran space. And one thing you hear about veterans transitioning from the military to the private sector is how they transfer their military mm. resume into a private sector resume. Mm -hmm. But you just talked about how you transfer your parenting resume into your career resume and, and shocking, you know, no, no surprise. You nailed it on the head where you're like, you know, these are just transferable skills in terms of leadership and negotiation. And I'm constantly negotiating with my 16 year old daughter, as I'm sure you can appreciate. And so uh, I never thought of that. That's a great analogy. So thank you for that. Of course. Yeah. How has the work from home movement changed things for working parents? both for better and for worse? Mm. Um, well, first let's talk about the brand new parents. And then we can talk about the parents who are a little bit more quote unquote experienced parents. Seasoned. Um, seasoned, yes, that's good. The, the salt and pepper here, <laughs> yes. Um, I was thinking of like all the seasonings in my, in my uh, drawer. So for the brand new parents, I think the work from home presented, I guess for everyone, it presented both challenges and opportunities. But for the brand new parents, there were really big benefits of not having to send a child to childcare and deal with like the illnesses that came with that. Um, and also just for a lot of new moms, the ability to not have to worry about pumping milk throughout the day, which is a huge deal when you're a brand new working parent. It's something I did for nearly two years when you add up all the months from both of my children. And, you know, just the opportunity to like feed your baby throughout the day while you're working and have a lot of extra family time together, I think alleviated a lot of guilt and pressure on new parents. Um, and then the, the downside was having to figure out how to create boundaries and work properly um, and get into focus while your baby was crying in the next room. Um, and so there, you know, the solutions were things like noise canceling headphones and trying to get nannies to take babies for walks and things like that. But, you know, there are things 
that you just don't experience when you're out in an office and your baby is somewhere else. Um, I'd say for all parents, generally speaking, I don't know, Chris, it's a mixed bag. I mean, in a lot of places, parents now understand that they can have more flexibility than their employers were offering them before. And in fact, they're probably more efficient and more effective at getting things done uh, remotely. On the other hand, I fear um, a relegation to second class citizenship within some organizations um, of people who are working more remote hours than uh, in person hours. And I would never want working parents to once again feel as though they are um, the low person on the total pole. So I don't know, mixed bag, but I'm very enthusiastic about the flexibility that we've gained. Absolutely agree. Yeah. What is Mindful Return? How and when did you develop it? And what was the driving force <laughs> or inspiration behind it? Mm. So Mindful Return is a movement designed to support working parents in feeling connected to one another and confident as they progress through their working parent journey. Um, at its sort of signature basic core, it is a four week online cohort based course that helps a new parent transition back to work after parental leave. And we have another course for more seasoned experienced parents called Mindful Return 201 that helps working parents navigate life. Um, it was really, you know, that eight and a half years ago when I said, gosh, there should be something out there. And then the process of creating what I wished had existed for myself when I was going through that transition that prompted me to create this program. Um, and it's just grown sort of exponentially ever since. So it sounds like it's best to take a course before becoming a parent. Yes. But if someone is just now hearing about Mindful Return and already has a child, at what point is it too late for them to benefit from the lessons you teach? Never, never, Chris. So our courses for new parents um, are best taken while you are actually out on parental leave. And the stresses of trying to figure out how you're going to make a return and how that's going to go are starting to spike. Um, about two thirds of our course participants take the course while they're out on leave and about a third take the new parent course within six months after coming back from leave. But then beyond that, we have a weekly newsletter and a podcast and a whole bunch of resources for working parents broadly. And our 201 level course is for anyone who has children, period, no matter what the age of the child is. So we'd like to think that we're you know, able to support you throughout the continuum of working parenthood. And that's why you've got the 201 course. Yes. And before I forget also, where can folks, what's the name of the podcast and where can they find you? Yeah, so there's the Parents at Work podcast, which you can find on all the places, one fine podcast. And you can find me and my work at mindfulreturn.com. Laura, we've been talking a lot about working moms. Mm -hmm. Let's shift the conversation to working dads. Is being a working dad today easier or more challenging than previous generations? I don't know that there's an answer to that question, Chris. Um, I'd say it's different in many ways. Um, the There has definitely been a cultural shift toward more fathers participating in caregiving activities and more expectation by fathers that their employers are going to be more accommodating of that shift. Um, so I, I don't know what's easier or harder. I think in some ways, uh, participating in caregiving and working allows someone to be more fully human. And so it may be in some sense, it's easier that you get to participate or that dads get to participate more. In some ways, it was probably easier before when the expectations were so clear that it was just work and bring the money home and then not worry about the rest. So I, I don't know. I don't think that there's an answer, but it's just things are definitely shifting. I remember when my wife and I had our first and she, I mentioned, just uh, turned 20 last month. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember the Saturday mornings at the local Y here was all dads with the babies doing swim lessons. Mm -hmm. uh, so definitely seeing that transition and the moms were getting the well-deserved sleep that they needed from uh, <laughs> from the previous week. My producer recently became a grandparent for the first time. And his son works for a large bank that shall remain nameless, and he received four months of parental leave. Parental leave for dads, especially four months of parental leave, is something that was unheard of not that long ago. Uh, again, when we had our first, I had two weeks, and I took three days one week and three days the next week. The new grandparents were worried about the son taking off that much time and how it would affect his job, especially now as the economy is getting softer, companies are laying off employees. How can this generation of parents assure their own nervous Nelly parents that taking parental leave is not going to ruin their careers. I don't know that there's anything that can reassure nervous Nelly parents. So I'm just gonna put that to the side. <laughs> so it, maybe it's not really about what you can say, 
but I guess I would put out there that I don't believe we're ever going to reach gender parity and equal pay until we can stop labeling flexibility and leave as a gendered issue. So one of my big passions is they need to de-gender and de-stigmatize parental leave. If women are being discriminated against in the workforce because, oh my gosh, they might get pregnant one day, so we don't want to hire them for that position. If it is just as likely that the man is going to take four months off for a leave, then you reduce and eliminate that, that um, discrimination. And so to the grandparents, first, I would say, if you have a granddaughter, you want your grandson to also take parental leave because you want her to succeed in the workplace too. Will it hurt his career prospects? I don't know. I can't guarantee that he doesn't have a biased manager. Um, I can't guarantee that anyone has a decent manager. Um, I am a big believer in training for managers on how to cope with parental leaves on a team and making sure that managers get the skills that they need to be able to cope through a process of having someone leave the team for a few weeks and knowing what assumptions to make and not make about new parents. Um, in the parental leave space, we call it winning the manager lottery. And so I can't reassure anyone's parent or grandparent that their, uh, that their child or grandchild has won the manager lottery. But I would say that there are a lot of organizations out there that have more progressive policies and attitudes. And if for perchance, it ruins his opportunity at this particular location where he is working, perhaps that is not the best fit for him as a parent in life. And there are a million other opportunities he can pursue. I am not of the belief that one particular opportunity that we either forego or take can ruin our whole career or life because there is an abundance and plethora of opportunities out there in the world. So I'd say he's going to be okay and he's doing the right thing in some. I love it. And grandparents don't just worry about their kids and grandchildren. They're a valuable resource as well. How should new parents make the most of that resource without taking advantage of the grandparents? Mm. There are so many families now, and ours is one, who don't live near family. And so a lot of the people who I am working with in the Mindful Return community are people who don't have the village nearby. And so I don't think that there's much of a taking advantage going on there um, because there's just no one to go dump your kids off with <laughs> at all hours of the day or night. Um, but I do think that really open communication between the generations um, assuming positive intent between the two generations and just making sure people are open and clear on what their expectations are is, is how we're going to navigate that. As with working moms, you see that working dads can structure their new lives in a way that advances them both as a parent and a professional. Mm -hmm. Without giving away your whole course, tell us how that can work. I mean, I, I come back to this idea of the fact that parenthood is a tra an amazing training ground for leadership, and it's just as true for fathers as it is for mothers. Um, the course that we take um, Mindful Return participants through um, focuses on four themes that I believe are critical to the, a successful transition to working parenthood. Indeed, there are four themes that are super helpful no matter what life transition you're going to, whether it's moving into a new house or changing jobs or retiring. And those four themes that we focus on in the program and that I think working dads and working moms can take to heart are a mindful mindset for going through the transition. So how do we get our head in a better place? Um, how do we quell our anxieties and how do we um, give ourselves compassion as we're going through this time? Uh, the second theme is logistics. There are logistical tips and tricks that can help new parents and that we need to you know, feed to one another to help get ourselves through the jujitsu of a working parent day. Um, the third theme is that leadership piece, the remembering that we're gaining these skills, that we are growing teams, um, whether our village teams or our work, workplace teams through parenthood. And then the fourth piece is community and community building. That's the fourth theme, which is something that I think all working parents need to focus on. Finding your people, finding the other working dads in your office, finding the other working moms at your office and commiserating and um, working to advance each other's causes and being uh, loud enough that people know that you're in this position so they can come talk to you if they have an issue too. I was very out and loud about being a partner at a law firm on a 60% schedule. 
whenever I was at my last firm. Um, and I did that in part because I wanted other people to see that there was a model that was possible um, where someone wasn't a full-time partner uh, working 24 seven and who was still successful and still managed to navigate client responsibilities and um, challenging tasks, even while holding a, a different model for, for that role. What are the biggest challenges internally and externally faced by parents as they return to work and are the challenges the same for women and men? Hmm. Some are the same, some are not. I think it depends on each individual's household, but we're all tired, right? I mean, there's a lot of lack of sleep going on in those early days. Um, I think uh, from a mother's perspective, some of the challenges are around society telling us that we're not supposed to be um, working and that there's something to feel guilty about for dropping a child off at, at daycare or childcare. Um, and so there's that guilt component. There's also the, the pumping milk again, which is something that anyone who is, I guess, chest feeding will face, but dads tend not to, to have to deal with the practicalities of that. Um, on the fatherhood side, I'd say there's um, societal expectations and stigmas around caregiving. It's, it's really not okay to talk about caregiving in the workplace as a dad. Um, you know, I witnessed or heard about an experience at a law firm where um, a father, for example, took his parental leave and then he came back and his office had been moved to what used to be sort of like a broom closet. And so it's sort of that statement of, well, you're not really important here anymore. And getting back to the nervous Nelly concern, there are people who view you as less than. And so I think the challenges coming back are in part logistical and in part mindset and confidence. You believe that parenting can enrich someone's career and vice versa. Can you elaborate on that point, please? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I said this before, but I am more creative and better at the work that I do every day um, because I work and I am better at parenting because I'm better at parenting because I work and better at because I parent. Um, Yael Schoenbrunn, who's a, a psychologist, Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn at Brown University, does a lot of work about work-life enrichment and how we often view work and life as these competing tensions that are fighting for one another's time. But in reality, um, you know, she has, she has a really funny quip in her book, um, Work Parent Thrive is the name of the book that she wrote that came out in November. And she has a funny quip. I think she's quoting a professor who said something like, I know the key to work like ba life balance is to only work and not have anything else in the rest of life. And that exactly that isn't exactly the way one probably wants to live. And so um, it is the other parts of life that en enrich us and make us human. And we can carry all of those back to work and they're fully translatable as we talked about in the last half an hour. And do you feel, again, as we come through the post-COVID, post-pandemic, and we were you know, roughly two <laughs> plus years, two and a half years, having work and life under the same roof? Do you think we we learned a lot during that process in terms of how to manage both and how to deal with the stresses of both and especially when you may have two working spouses and two or three kids at home all on zoom calls for school and just a lot of stuff going on do you think that helped us in this next chapter transitioning that's what it helped me with was immense gratitude for the fact that my children are out of the house <laughs> i mean we were home for 15 straight months 15 i don't even know how we did that um i mean my husband and i like just did a jigsaw puzzle of the day and swap back and forth and you know one of us tried to go do the zoom meeting with the one kid and then the other kid and then the, it was just a disaster and what it taught me was that it was a disaster and that that is not the way to, to integrate work and life um and i just feel deep gratitude for every moment that i am able to sit at my desk alone and do work now so i'm sure it prepared us in many ways for um resilience and um it probably pres um helped us to become, as you and I were talking earlier, more empathetic, um, more open to talking about the harsh realities of life. Um, I think working parenthood was a challenge before the pandemic. It got into like a blazing dust pit fire of I don't even know what. <laughs> and now we're returning to some semblance of, okay, I can breathe again, which is good. Well, you and I were talking before the show. I mentioned that today was our first snowfall in Connecticut and my yes. kids' first snow days. So I'm having flashbacks to COVID where everybody's in the house. I'm like, oh, <laughs> so to your point, yes, I, I miss my alone time at my desk. It Come is on. not what we had going on then was just not sustainable. No, at all. And no. there's a huge, I just want to put a plug in for the fact that there's a huge childcare crisis in this country right now. A yes. lot of childcare 
places closed during the pandemic, and we are not set up for empowering uh, working parents to succeed when people are not able to have their children be taken care of by caregivers. So that's a systemic problem that we uh, agree. Need to and, and the other piece of that puzzle, I think, is the uh, child mental health crisis we're having right now. Yes, absolutely. I just read that somewhere around 50% of all teenagers are having um, mental health related mm -hmm. challenges right now. And I totally believe that and see it and definitely experienced it in my own household. Yeah. And like you said, you and I, our sons were seven at the time. They're now 10. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's a third of their life. Yes. In a exactly. pandemic. And what that's going to be, I don't know, but yeah. lessons learned. Not good. You teach a lot of lessons in Mindful Return. Again, I don't want you to give away the secret sauce, but I would like you to share your thoughts on a few things that jumped out at me. Okay. First, how to return to work with confidence. How important is it to return to work with the right mindset? And how does a new parent gain that confidence? Yeah, that's such a great question. I think how important it is that you return to, the, with, to work with the right mindset. I mean, it's everything. It is how you show up in the morning. Um, it is getting yourself into that desk and saying, I'm going to do this even if I feel completely sleep deprived and groggy today. Um, in terms of confidence, one of the exercises that we have our um, participants in our course go through is to reflect on a time in pre-parenthood when they felt like there was an insurmountable challenge in their lives and they didn't think they were going to be able to make it through and somehow they did. And so part of that exercise is really reminding ourselves that we know how to summon up courage for things. We know how to get over big obstacles. We know how to figure things out that we had no idea how to figure out. And parenthood is gonna be like that. And just reminding everybody in the program that like we all have these skills and we can use them again as parents. Um, I think whether or not you have your head in the right mindset, you may have to go back to the office. Um, and there is one piece of advice that I try to make sure that we impart to all new working parents, which is not to make radical life decisions in the first couple of months after you've made this shift back to work. I mean, some people think, okay, I gotta just blow everything up and go do this other thing right now. Just wait a few months. Um, it took me a year following the return to work after each of my children to feel more like myself again. And it's a, I, I like to say the transition back to work after having a baby is a process, not an event. So after you've been back for a week or two and people are like, okay, you're settled in now. The answer is no, <laughs> I'm not settled in now. In a few months, maybe I'll feel a little bit more settled in, but just give yourself patience and time. And it's, it's a process that you need to go through. And here's a topic I think any parent can relate to no matter how young or old they are. Mm -hmm overcoming guilt at home and at work. Hmm. How do we, how do we do that? Oh, the big G word, Chris. <laughs> I, have a, I have a whole like um, stockpile of different tools that I pull out on guilt, uh, depending on the day and how I'm feeling and whatever I've got, you know, this like tool chest is what I was looking for. The tool chest of resources. One is sometimes I pull out the Sarah Blaffer Hardy quote and say, okay, women have been working for this since the dawn of time. Um, sometimes I, pull out um, a coach that I work with frequently named Lauren Gordon. She taught me this particular word trick where when you're saying in your head, I feel guilty because you change it to, I made this decision because, which can help you to ground in the values and the reasons why you chose the thing. I made this decision to work on a Saturday afternoon because this project needs to get done and I will be more present with my children tonight if I can have this time to get it finished and be able to really engage with them later. So the, um, I, I chose this because it's a good reframe. Another um, strategy that I use is uh, sort of drawn from Rumi's poem, The Guest House, which is just all about welcoming into your world and home all the unwelcome things that you might just have to deal with. And so recognizing that guilt is just one emotion among many that will pass through your head and your body and your, you know, in a day, sometimes you will feel sad and that's normal. And sometimes you will feel happy and that's normal. And sometimes you'll feel guilty and that's normal too. And just sort of making it part of the normal events. Sometimes if I sit with the guilt and say, okay, like, welcome. Hi, I see that you're there. You can sit here for a while while I do this thing. Um, it tends to move on rather than if I fight against it. So just a couple of guilt related tricks. The big G word. I'll never forget that one out. 
we've been focused on the parent side of the equation, but what about employers? How should or can employers approach mindful return to get the most benefit for themselves and their employees? Yeah, um, employers are absolutely critical to making this transition a success. And there's so much that an employer can do to help support a new parent making a transition back to work after parental leave. There are some things that cost money and there are some that don't. I mean, yes, providing paid parental leave is fantastic and we should be doing that. And we should have a national policy of doing that too. So it's not just on the employer's shoulders, but that's for another day. Um, employers can, as I said earlier, teach their managers how to navigate the departure and return of a working parent. Now, um, employers can implement transition phase back in policies that allow someone to not come back at 100%, but to come back at maybe 60% this month, 80% the next month, and 100% the next month, all at 100% pay, and um, allow you to sort of ease back into work. Um, the program that we provide, Mindful Return, allows uh, an employer's colleagues, the, the new parents who are returning, to enter a community of other working parents who are all going through that same transition at the exact same time that they are, so that they're not feeling alone. They're talking to people in other industries and sectors who are all sort of in the same stage and realizing that it's not just them, it's not just their employer. It's like a life transition that they need help navigating. And what we found with Mindful Return is that when an employer provides this course or this program to their employee, they're saying to the employee, I want you to come back. I care about you. I know you have skills and here's a tool to help you do it. And almost as important as actually like participating in the course is that signal from the employer that says, we care about you, we want you to come back. Um, so I think to the extent employers can celebrate the baby's arrival, celebrate the return. There are employers who, you know, toss my book back to work after baby into the like baby, the company onesie, you know, present for the new parents. Um, I think celebrating that life event goes a long, long way in helping the employer with loyalty and retention, quite frankly, of that, that new working parent. You talked about being involved with different industries, different sectors. Tell us about the global success of Mindful Return. Oh, I love that question. I have always loved uh, international understanding and cooperation and foreign languages, as we talked about earlier, and you know, living in France. And so um, I am so excited that Mindful Return now has chapters in a number of foreign countries. Um, we've had participants from all over the globe from the beginning. In one of the early sessions of Mindful Return eight years ago had someone from the Dutch Navy who just happened to find it online and joined. So, you know, it's been international from the start. But um, shortly after the pandemic began, um, a wonderful coach um, and ex-big law attorney in London reached out to me, her name is Anya Smirnova, and she said, what about a, a UK chapter of Mindful Return? I think we need that here. And it was the, the thick of the pandemic and I just couldn't deal with like life and home. And I was like, good idea, but let's wait. And so after I regained my footing, um, we got back together and started talking about launching a, a British version, which we've done. We now have chapters in South Africa and India, and we've translated our program into Spanish and Portuguese as well. A lot of that was really um, employer driven too, where employers have said, hey, we have employees in Latin and South America who we want to be able to help navigate this transition too. Can you, you know, translate your program? So I, I love working globally. My dream one day is to have a retreat of all the people who work with Mindful Return. There are 20 of us now on the team, um, all meet in some country internationally and get to meet each other in person for the first time. Congratulations on all your success. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Lori, we're coming up on the end of our show. If someone wants to get a hold of you and learn more about Mindful Return, where can they find you? Sure. So we are at mindfulreturn.com. Um, I do a Tuesday tip for working parents on Instagram. So you can follow me over there. You can feel free to reach out on LinkedIn and say that you listen to this podcast and I would be happy to connect with you on LinkedIn. Um, also on Facebook and our Parents at Work podcast is on all the places you find podcasts. Um, you can find my book, Back to Work After Baby, in all the places one finds books. And um, what's left? Lori at mindfulreturn.com is my email. Perfect. Lori Mahalik Levin, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. I really love this conversation. It's been no, a pleasure. Likewise. Likewise. Thank you. And thanks for audience for joining us for another episode of Next Steps Forward. I'm Chris Meek. For more details on upcoming shows and guests, please follow me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Chris Meek Public Figure. 
and on Twitter at Chris Meek underscore USA. We'll be back next Tuesday, same time, same place, with a leader from the world of business, politics, public policy, sports, or entertainment. Until then, stay safe and keep taking your next steps forward.